Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at deformation and metamorphic rocks. So in this video we're going to be thinking about how do rocks fracture and this is going to correspond to section 8.3 of the textbook. So the first thing to remember is that when we're talking about rocks fracturing what we're discussing is brittle deformation and because it's brittle deformation it means that this type of uh, deformation can only occur in the upper 10 to 15 kilometers of the Earth's crust. So bear that in mind when we're discussing this particular topic. So the first thing that can happen is when we have a block of rock, we can expose it to uh, strains and stresses, and this can lead to our block of rock failing. It can fracture. Now, when we form our fracture, we're obviously going to take one piece of rock and we're going to be splitting it into at least two pieces. So in this particular model, you can see we formed two pieces of rock by splitting it along the fracture, which we can see here. Now, if these two pieces of rock do not move relative to each other, so they don't go up or down relative to each other, then what we are looking at is a joint. So if we look at this outcrop here, we can see this is an outcrop of granite, and we can see this outcrop of granite has lots and lots of vertical lines. These are the joints. And so these joints have been formed in response to tectonic stresses. They've essentially caused the rock to fracture, but the most important thing is that the pieces of rock either side of the fracture are not moving relative to each other. They, we will therefore classify these fractures as joints. Now, the other type of fracture that can form is a fault. So in the case of a fault, once again, we've taken a block of rock and we've split it into at least two units. So you can see this particular block has been split into one block and another block. Now, in the case of a fault, though, these blocks of rock will move relative to each other. They will slide past each other. So there's motion involved. So this is the key difference between a joint where there is no relative movement between the blocks and a fault where there is relative movement between the blocks. And so we can see that very nicely in this picture of a fault right here. This is actually the fracture itself. So this is our fault plane coming through here like so. And we can get a sense of the movement by looking at the layers of rock. And we're actually gonna focus in on this red layer right here. And you can see this orange line represents the top of this red layer and the blue line represents the bottom of this red layer. And so if we continue across, we can see there's our fault. And on the other side of the fault, we can actually see our red layer is located there. So we can see once again, the top in orange and the bottom in blue. And so what we can quite clearly see by tracking this layer of rock across our fault, we can see that this block of rock on the right hand side has dropped down relative to this block of rock on the left hand side. We have therefore had movement along this fracture and it is therefore going to be considered a fault. So now we need to think about some of the stresses that can lead to the formation of joints. So the first type of stress that can lead to the formation of joints are burial stresses and tectonic forces. So joints can be formed either due to extension, so stretching our rock, causing it to break, or it can be caused by compression. So if we have a situation where we have a block of rock and we have a differential stress and the differential stress is vertical, so it's pushing on the top and the bottom of our rock, that can also cause the rock to fracture, creating a joint. So the forces that are, in, are being imparted due to tectonic processes or simply due to our rock being buried deeper and deeper in the earth can lead to the rock being put under sufficient strain to cause it to crack. And we can see that in this outcrop here. Once again, we have an outcrop of what appears to be granite. And you can see, once again, we have lots and lots of vertical joints. And these joints could have formed in, you know, as a result of tectonic stresses or possibly due to this particular uh, piece of granite being buried to a very deep depth, exposed to extreme pressure, thereby leading to the formation of these joints. So the next way that we can form joints is due to cooling and contraction. And this is something that we only tend to see in igneous rock. We can see it in some types of sedimentary and metamorphic rocks, but in the vast majority of cases, most cooling cracks will be associated with igneous rocks. So in the case of cooling cracks, what happens is, is we have a material that cools down and this material is obviously hot. So let's think of a lava flow. So we have our lava flow, it's extruded onto the surface of the earth and obviously the lava flow is exposed to the atmosphere and it begins to solidify. 
So let's think of a mafic lava flow, which is going to produce a basalt. So the basalt gets erupted onto the surface of the earth and it's got a temperature of about 1,100 to 1,200 degrees Celsius. Now that lava is, that mafic lava is going to cool down rather quickly and by about 950 Celsius, the lava is going to be fully solidified. So all the, all the lava is gone and it's all turned into solid minerals. Now the most important thing to remember is that even at this point our rock is still extremely hot, it's at 950 Celsius. And so our rock is going to continue cooling down from 950 Celsius all the way down to the whatever the ambient temperature is, let's say 25 Celsius. So that means there's 925 Celsius of cooling which our rock will have to achieve. Now, as our rock is cooling down, it's obviously going to contract, it's going to get smaller as it loses heat. Now, during this contraction process, what can happen is our rock can fracture due to the contraction. And this will lead to the formation of columnar joints. And we can see some right here in this basaltic flow. So this is a mafic flow, and we can see the formation of these hexagonal and pentagonal uh, columns due to uh, cracks which have formed as the lava flow has cooled down. The final method of forming joints is through unloading. So in the case of unloading, you have rock which has been essentially under pressure due to overburden. So the rock above it pushing down on it puts our region of rock under increased pressure. So what can happen is the rock which is putting this area under pressure can steadily be eroded away. And obviously as the rock above gets eroded away, the pressure on our rock begins to decrease. And so as the pressure on our rock begins to decrease, our rock which was under pressure, so it was being squished and therefore forced into a smaller volume, can all of a sudden begin to expand because the pressure is getting lower. And this expansion can lead to the formation of joints. And so we can see that happening right here. So here we have an outcrop where we have a rock that's been under pressure and the release of this pressure has led to the formation of all of these joints which are running parallel to each other. So this has been produced by unloading. So essentially the rock that was above it has been eroded away and this has brought this particular area of rock closer to the surface. The pressure has dropped, the rock has expanded and due to this expansion process, it's ended up forming joints. So now we're going to think about how does a rock deform when exposed to a compressive stress? So how are we going to end up forming faults in this particular instance? So in this model, you can see we have a column of rock and we're going to be compressing it from the top and the bottom. Now in the, this first instance, we can see that the stress is relatively low. And so our block, our column of rock does not undergo any change. It's, you know, maintains its, uh, the original dimensions. Now, as we begin to increase the stress, we can see that our rock is beginning to behave in a slightly ductile fashion. It's bulging slightly. So we can see that the total height of our column of rock has decreased slightly, but we can see that the diameter of our column of rock has increased. Now, if we keep loading our rock up, so we keep applying more stress to it, eventually we are going to exceed the strength of our rock and our rock is going to fail in a brittle fashion. It's going to fracture. So obviously in this particular instance, we can see that our rock has fractured. The fracture is quite visible there, but we can also see that these two pieces of rock have not moved relative to each other. So at the moment, we would classify this particular fracture as a joint. Now, as more pressure is applied to our blocks of rock, what's going to happen is this added pressure is now going to start forcing these blocks of rock to move relative to each other. So these blocks of rock are going to start slipping past each other. And when this slip process begins, obviously we have one block of rock moving relative to another block of rock. So now we've transitioned from a joint and our fracture is now going to be classified as a fault. All right, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.